Let me introduce today's speaker. He is Dr. Fahim Shah. He is the director of the Indian Center in AIT. And let me tell you, um, uh, give you a short introduction about him. He is currently, uh, sorry, he currently heads uh, development management um, at uh, AIT and is also the director of the UMS Center in AIT. He teaches the CSR Master's Program in the AIT School of Management. I think you guys wanted to be there, right? And he, he's also currently coordinating the AITE Health Resource Group and he also co-directs the Energy Distribution Services Management and Technology Program. And he's also a visiting group, uh, professor at the uh, College of uh, Innovation at the Mazat University, which is our neighbors, right? Okay, so today his topic is Social Business 101, which is uh, based on principles of uh, SDG. Have you heard about SDG? Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, so we'll hear more from him today. So let's welcome Dr. Ferris. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind. Well, good morning, uh, guys. Um, we want this to be a, a fun session, so uh, the, the introductions have to be kind of fun as well. So I'll tell you a story. Uh, much before I became what I am today, which is like a teacher, I was a business person. And I ended up, uh, I started as a teacher, but then I realized that uh, there's more excitement in life than standing in front of people, uh, trying to tell them what they already know. So ended up doing, setting up a company. And as luck would have it, it became the world's largest in its category. We had 8,000 employees in 14 countries. And uh, it became some of the most exciting uh, experiences that I've ever had in my life. But then I became a teacher again because I was too tired and old to run around the world uh, producing uh, equipment, materials, and managing supply chains for 14 major brands in the world. So I came back to teaching. So the story is that there's no fixed trajectory in life. You can move easily in and out of careers. If somebody comes and tells you that, oh, you are so, you know, this is your age and this is what you should be doing at this age and this is what you should be pursuing, do listen to them because there is wisdom in what people tell you. But people will tell you what they think is best for you, but only you know what is best for you. But then you can't imagine what's best for you. You have to experience to know what is best for you. So the reason I tell you this story is that being, being a teacher is fun. Being a business person is fun. Being an employee is fun. Being an architect is fun. Being whatever is fun. Only if you think it's fun. So be what you be for yourself first and not what others expect of you all the time. Yes, if others expect you to be truthful and honest and being on time and fulfilling your promises and showing up for friends, yeah, that's a good expectation. But we're not talking about being good people. We're talking about being enterprise leaders, innovators, and people who can build change around ourselves. So for that, independence is an element that is necessary. For every young leader, one thing that just, just marks people from being leaders and not is the sense of independence. So I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're all together. I know there's 14 countries here in this room and they're all very diverse countries. They're all extremely different countries. We speak different languages. We look at ourselves differently. We have different customs and traditions. We all, even sometimes, people in this room might not even know about some of the things that we take for granted in our country. So this is a very interesting mix. It's a very interesting group. But one thing unites you all, if, if anything does unite you, which is a desire to improve yourselves. And that's the first level of independence. The the, the desire, the wanting, the motivation to improve yourself is the first step towards leadership. And the only leaders I know who I really respect are leaders 
who first changed themselves, as Gandhi said, who first changed themselves and then changed things around them and then the world changed around that. So the first step is independence, the first step is self-assuredness and also the first step is beginning to appreciate that you are responsible for your own future. Right? That was the story, that was the opening. Welcome, we're all here now, I think. I could have spoken longer because I was counting heads. Now we're all here, we can get into the real stuff. Okay, now we've got one more person coming in. So welcome to the Tiger Leong program, edition three. Uh, I'm very excited by, uh, by this program myself as well, because I think it provides for you and for us at EIT, a unique window into what young people are thinking in the region. The chosen topic for today is uh, innovation and social business. We've been stuck to the front of the program, although I had, we had planned for it to come perhaps towards the late, latter part of this program, because you would have gone through discussions on design thinking, on uh, ideation, on, and looking at a few examples where this thing has worked. You would have talked about disruptive technologies and blockchains and all these exciting things, right? That show on the program. And then we would have come in and tried to say, all right, how are you going to all use all this stuff to achieve the sustainable development goals through business? But now that we're here, I'm going to have to steal a bit from every discussion ahead of them, not too much, to set the context for what social business is. The activity for today, I'll just be here for the first few, uh, well, about 90 minutes, I think, if they can get to stop me to talk. And uh, after that, I've got a full team here who will conduct a series of activities which will drive you into appreciating the idea or the power of social business. So we'll talk about what social business is, how it works, how ideas and innovations and sustainability concepts can be intertwined into business ideas and how business can help solve the world's problems, which are, of course, the, uh, defined or, or described as the 17 goals. So here's, here's something that we need to now get started on. Three things strike me as we listen to your introductions. One, the diversity, because you all come from various different disciplines, sciences. Uh, we have people in literature, we have people in science, we have in engineering. That's, that's great. The second thing that strikes me is uh, the diversity in what you imagine this thing to be, this, this event to be. Uh, because, you know, the, there's some people who talk about more specific things like women empowerment or working with uh, impaired uh, individuals and so on. And other people just want to make friends and network and meet other people, right? This is precisely what society is composed of. Some of us are more concrete in what we want. Some of us are still deciding. Some of us don't want to decide. And that is very normal. And this is exactly what I started to say, that what feels right to you is what's right for you. So if you've come here to make friends, make sure you make friends. If you've come here to find ideas that you can take back to your own country to make, to implement, please do that. If you're here to engage with a new culture and be part of something that you've not experienced before, please do that. So don't lose sight of everything you said here was said for a purpose. I just wanted us to remind ourselves why we are here. And all the rest that follows during the rest of the day and the rest of the program should reinforce that primary purpose that brought you to the Tiger Leon program. Because that is your first step towards independent thinking. Getting what you want in a way that you want to get it, but by making friends and by learning from each other, by exposing yourself to other points of view. And so it's a great beginning. I, I'm, I'm very happy to have you all here. Now, uh, what am I going to talk about? This presentation will follow, but I have a short message for you because I think my time will be up in about 15 minutes. There are three things that confront the world today, which all of us are familiar with. One, there is a, a severe stress on the global resources. You look for food security, you're looking at water, you're looking at people under the poverty line, because they don't have enough food that they can grow, etc., lack of subsistence. All this 
hits us in the face everywhere. Even if you go to developed countries, you find there are issues with resources. That's the first issue. That whether you're from Cambodia or Lao or Malaysia or Taiwan, everybody is feeling that the kind of resources we have gotten ourselves used to are getting less and less available. The second main issue that all of us often run into is that the world is becoming a smaller place because of information, because of technology, because the freedom to go from one place to the other or even if you can't physically travel access to information about what's happening in the remotest part of the world has made the world a very small place and you know when places become small they become tense people get frightened of how they might get affected or their lives might get affected by people they don't know very well in the olden days this used to happen when a lot of immigrants came to a country and they started to interfere in the local norms and local ways of life of people and that created stress and that sometimes created well bad things but sometimes created good things as well but the world now you don't really have to go to a place to affect the culture society resources you can be sitting where you are and still take other people's resources other people's ideas or influence ways in which people work in a different part of the world like never before so while we are creating this small world it's creating better communication it's creating better linkages it's also creating more uncertainties why because now we suddenly realize we don't speak the same languages we don't uh, aspire to the same goals but we all run after the same resources and the third thing that everybody perhaps already realizes that shapes uh, uh, perhaps a lot of thinking among young people is the disparity in incomes in quality of life in the resources that we are able to spread the disparity itself not the resources not the closeness or the globalization but the sheer gap that is now being created between people who have resources and people who don't have anything and if you read uh, Muhammad Yunus's latest book which came out last November it's called the three zeros uh, it's available online but uh, you know uh, I think we we might be even able to share uh, excerpts of that he says the biggest issue now is income disparity and income disparity is created by wealth concentration so Yunus feels that some of the largest issues in the world are created by greed why does income disparity happen why does wealth concentration uh, become more and more exacerbated because some people are able to through their minds through technology through ideas whatever good things marshal more and more resources and by doing that become individually more and more well rich or well endowed but that happens at the cost of other people it happens at the cost of the environment and sometimes it even happens at the cost of general well-being around themselves so this creates so many other issues among them poverty so if you look at the distribution of wealth in the world if you look at the globalization of the world and if you look at the way we are running short on our essential resources you realize that some of the most talked about models of development that we have experimented with in the last 70, 80, 100 years have let us down, right? So what was the great model? When the Industrial Revolution happened a couple of hundred years ago, the idea was to create a welfare state where all citizens of a particular community or a country would enjoy a basic minimum standard of living and the state would guarantee inclusion the state would guarantee inclusion in education including inclusion in finance and in resources in social services and the equality that the, the the people would aspire would come in economic terms so on the one hand you had the the socialist way of thinking where people were physically required to be equal but there were other ways also where people were given equal rights as voters 
in democratic systems where the vote equalized people. There were other systems in which resources were distributed by the state free. Countries like Libya or even at one time Iraq, Saudi Arabia at one time. So they were neither democracy nor votes, etc. But everybody got state handouts. There were different interpretations of the welfare state from parity of votes to rights to, to, to uh, right to various services, whatever. That welfare state model lasted a long time. But you know, the welfare state model was premised on one very questionable thing. The welfare state took resources from other countries and then made sure that their own citizens were given a better quality of life. This was immediately past the colonial era where the richest countries were actually also countries that had had colonial possessions in not too uh, distant pasts. So that was one thing. The welfare state as it grew converted itself from colonial possessions to industrialization, to knowledge work, to people producing goods and services that could be sold outside the country. So we had these big export economies, industrial countries, which then became rich and were able to distribute privilege and wealth as well as uh, whatever else the state is able to do, give, health, education, and so on. And then we saw that the post-industrial society began to suffer with this because the welfare state was stretching itself beyond plausible limits. And therefore, we had issues with that. So then people became anxious. You had political movements because people had gotten used to a certain quality of life. And when the state was not able to prepare them or, or give them that, there was discontent. We know this already. But where all this was happening, the second model was the aid model or the welfare or the philanthropy model. Of course, I'm not talking about individual philanthropy or community philanthropy. I'm talking about state governments giving other state governments money or resources or expertise as foreign aid. So people thought that while the rich countries were getting rich and they were giving their own citizens a reasonably good quality of life, some felt an obligation to then use some of that resource, uh, resource or some of that wealth to divert to poorer countries, which was another way of equalizing assets and access to resources and inclusion. So aid was the other one. At the micro level, there was charity. You had people who endowed, who, who earned a lot of money or un, earned money beyond what they thought they needed and they were able to share it. So they were building hospitals, schools, they were helping people in need and so on. So there was the welfare state, which was trying to get resources to people. And then there was charity, which was then filling or trying to fill the gaps that the state was not able to, right? But still we find that people were getting poorer and poorer and poorer on one end of the spectrum and then richer and richer and richer on the other end of the spectrum. So Eunice looks at this as well. And he finds that there's a problem in, in, the, in the financial or in the economic system that we've managed to build very successfully. The economic system that has actually benefited the world in many ways. But as a side effect, it has also created extremes of income access or wealth access. So it has made a lot of people very rich and others not at all. So what is this wealth model? The model is, it's the entrepreneurial model. The person that has the idea, the person that can successfully put that idea, create a business out of it, tends to take in all the rewards, right? And it's considered normal now. That it was my idea, it was my risk, it was my effort, and so I should make all the money. Does it sound reasonable to you? If you agree with this idea, that anybody that has the idea, the effort, the hard work deserves all the, all the benefits from it. You agree with it, right? This is, the, this is the classic entrepreneurial mindset. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. So if I'm taking all the risk, why should I spread this out? So there was only one hand up. 
who believes in this idea of out and out entrepreneurial uh, privilege two one two that means we are in the wrong room let's talk about this a little bit why didn't all the hands go up here so let's ask the two young men who've raised their hands to say what is your reason for believing in the sort of the extreme uh, idea of you know entrepreneur the the winner takes all approach as it's called in business as i've seen the past steve jobs or bill gates they discovered they discovered something they created something and uh, now they are the winners so, like according to me this is the this, this is, the is should this is how it should be yeah. okay that's that's fair enough it's a successful model we've seen that shall we wh why do you think it's Well, I, I believe in evolution, and evolution involves, uh, involves the, you know, it involves some species to fight and evolve to, you know, uh, the saying is that the, the it's the it's the fittest. For yeah, the survival yeah, of the fittest, right? That's very Darwinian, yeah? yeah. Yeah. So basically, if you work hard, if you do the best. That, that the market really values, then, then you're, you're, you're going to get all the benefits. There's no right. doubt for that. Perfect. This is a very good. So, but then why does Bill Gates also endow the largest amount in history to charity? $35 billion. Why does Bill Gates need to give it all away in the end? Have you figured that out? Because, or even survival of the fittest, we call it. Uh, even when the fittest are surviving, they are killing off some species. Yes, that's nature. But then others they are not able to kill, right? So it's a constant fight. It's an attritional state. Nature is not attritional. Nature is harmonious by definition. So you have created an artificial competition. Although you might subscribe to this theory of evolution, you might subscribe to this idea of the fittest need to survive, the other need to be extinct. But nature isn't designed that way. Nature allows symbiosis. Nature allows other uh, people to coexist with the most successful species. Insects live in the same micro, uh, uh, kind of ecosystem as predators. Yeah, some die, some live, some succeed, some fail. But there is no way nature is going to allow everybody else to get extinct because then the winners would have nothing to win for. So nature keeps a balance. But thanks for pointing that out, guys. Why does Bill Gates give away all his money afterwards? Because inherently, a human being, and this is Eunice again, has two sides simultaneously. Every person wants to succeed. Every person wants to be the best. Everybody wants to get what they want in life. And they want to struggle and strive for it, compete for it, and, you know, get the best out of it. At the same time, the same human being at the same time feels for other people. Feels for children, for women, for people in need, for giving back to society. So what's happening now is that we've divided our normal, natural, harmonious world into two extremes which need not be extremes. So we spend all our lives trying to make money at all costs, succeeding at all costs, even at the cost of other people's happiness or the cost of the environment or the cost of values sometimes. But then once we've got where we thought we wanted, we feel a vacuum. And then we want to give away. We want to build hospitals. We want to educate children. We want to plant trees. And we want to die happy. There's something wrong. Eunice thinks that this is what's making such a lot of this discussion uh, problematic because every human being must by hardwired design achieve both success in terms of money and relationships and friends and whatever wealth but also self-fulfillment and actualization and well-being and bliss as Jung calls it so what brings these things together is there a mechanism let's ask this again to you guys 
is there a mechanism in your mind in which these two supposedly opposite ideas can be brought together let's have hands up here now give it a thought how can you bring these two because they are essentially part of our same personality how do you think we can bring this together in society I'm looking at the guys from Bangladesh. You've heard this one before. So what, 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 what should we do? That we don't create this artificial divide in human nature, in nature. We can use the idea of social business. Yeah. And microeconomics, like whatever Dr. Lewis has been teaching us. Mm -hmm. We can use his ideas and merge them. Yeah, of course. You know the answer. But then what is social business? This is why I asked this question. Shall I ask anybody? Other than uh, our friends from Bangladesh because they know this so well already. Sorry, I didn't uh, let... But you can carry on. You had the microphone. Don't give it away. Say what you have to say and then we move. Uh, non-profit, non-loss business and which will impact on the society for its welfare. That is what social business is. Right. Good. We'll get more into that in detail, but hang on to those words. Thanks. Yeah. Where, where, where is the mic headed now? Yeah. Yeah. Katrina. Well, I think that social business is the business that uh, is aimed at solving uh, social problems, but at the same time, any business uh, needs revenues. So I think it is a scheme win-win. Yeah, well, this was a uh, yeah, great answer as well. What Yunus then came up with, because he had worked for so many years at the grassroots with the most marginalized people in Bangladesh, he realized that you can't phase your life into a life in pursuit of money and then in a life in pursuit of happiness. It should be somehow bring, brought together. But the way our economic system is designed, the way our education system is designed, the way our rewards in society are designed, the way we define success these days or have been defining success since the industrial revolution has somehow created a misperception amongst young people that in order to be successful, you only have to be rich. You only have to have a certain social status. You only have to dress in a certain way or talk in a certain way or have a certain kind of friends network. That is now challenged anywhere you go. That is already being challenged. But then what is the alternative? So the alternative is try to create a business which creates success, which makes money, which generates profits, which gives you everything that you need in terms of personal success, personal gratification, a, a, a relatively good level of income or wealth, and then at the same time allows you to solve problems for people who can't solve it themselves. Here is, there is a small catch in this conversation. Because the, the two young men that we had saying entrepreneurs should take all will probably agree with me when I say that there is a limit to all. When you start taking rewards that are rightfully yours but at, they come at the cost of other people's happiness, their own life standards and so on, a lot of people start thinking, does this all belong to me? And that's then when they start giving it away to charity. And Bill Gates is not the only example. In India, there are so many people. The, the Tata Empire itself is a, is a living example of how from 100 years ago, these guys have been very successful in business, but at the same time, one of India's largest philanthropic companies. So there are examples where this, this need to help others has been visible. Not Yunus was certainly not the first person to discover this idea. He was just the first person to make it work for a lot of people, for millions of people. So social business is what we will now discuss. I don't want to sort of get into that because there's a whole uh, discussion to follow and my time's coming to a close. 
But just to close by saying that we have now come to a point in the world where our three problems of, di uh, of, of uh, uh, diminishing resources, of, of globalizing tendencies and the, the uh, attendant tensions and then uh, all these other things that we talk about are now bringing young people to this kind of things because we are all looking for answers. We want to succeed as business people, as professors, as technologists, as philanthropists, whatever. But we also want to do it in a more humane way. Because we have seen in our communities, in our life, what disparity does to us. How divided our communities have become. How useless and futile it is, sometimes at one level, to make more and more money without having that money or that wealth help or improve the lives of other people. We have found that ourselves and that's why we come to places like this. So one of the solutions that we'll give you or one of the thinkings that we will send back with you is the idea of a competitive, productive, market-driven business which doesn't take charity. It competes in the market. It doesn't take subsidies. It doesn't ask governments for handouts or dole outs or bailouts. It competes with a goods or a service model or a business model that is successful in the market. And once you've done that, it doesn't wait for 20 years to start giving it back to communities. It creates an automatic nexus between the success in business and solving a social problem. So as you succeed in business, the more money you make, the more your business succeeds, the more people you help the more problems you are possibly able to solve and the more services and goods you are able to produce in support of your mission. That's the core of a social business. And once we've got that figured out, we can actually begin to join both our impulses, our impulses to succeed, make money and be wealthy with our impulse to be good human beings, helping others and solving problems. It will take a while. This is still a work in progress. Although there are more than 50 companies in Bangladesh alone which are social businesses. And now more and more companies in the world are becoming aware and are converting some of their business uh, subsidiaries or create floating new companies which are social businesses. It will take a while. But your generation is probably going to be the first generation which will see a widespread adoption of social business models. And we call this thing enterprise-led development. For many years, who were the key players in development? Governments and charities or NGOs or whatever you want to call them. Business was always there, but it had never a room at the table because business was always, one, themselves, too busy making money for their stockholders, two, People thought they are bad guys, they have all the money, they don't want to share. But we then realized that businesses are not composed of devils, they are actually people like us, but who, who have a way of conducting their economic life. So then, now with that divide becoming less and less prominent or less obvious, business has a room at the table. And now business is saying, how can we help? So more and more businesses are now open to listening to people who have ideas about social development and saying we'll put our money into this. So social business brings together these things. And so you'll hear more and more about this term called enterprise-led development because it's coming into fashion now. So, and maybe 10 years later, just like when I was a kid, I had never heard of certain terms. NGOs didn't exist when I was a kid. We had charities or welfare organizations but no big organizations that were more like corporate bodies that help other people in other countries. But now, NGOs are very common and even now they're on the way out because now companies are taking over and doing a lot of the work that philanthropists used to do through their own trusts and foundations. So enterprise-led development is something that we'll be talking about again. It's now time for me to hand over to uh, the gang here. Uh, there's some slides to show, there's some videos to show, but before I actually go, 
I'd like to thank you. But oh yeah, sure. One more thing. Uh, do you have any questions on this, or any thoughts? We had only any doubts about this whole idea of social business, of enterprise-led development, or any thoughts? You don't have to tell them, but keep them in your mind. If you want, you can write them down so that you don't forget. And then when as the slideshow goes on, maybe you'll have more questions. And then we can come back and answer some more. Right? So thank you for your wonderful <coughs> open-eyed attention. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Over to you, Kalam. So by a show of hands, who's heard of this gentleman, Amartya Sen? Any Indians? Anyone? No? Okay, that's great. So, <laughs> Amartya Sen uh, is an Indian gentleman, uh, an economist, and he says that poverty is not just a lack of money, it's a lack of not having the capability to realise one's full potential as a human being. And I really want to focus on this concept here of potential and ability and capability. And it's basically when we talk about capabilities, these are restrictions or you kind of think people being fenced in or walled in from being able to fulfill themselves. So this comes from education, this comes from health, this comes from uh, lack of employment, this can come from all sorts of things. A lack of being able to freely express oneself. If you're in a, a, in a, a despotic, uh, in a country that has a despotic regime. So what I'm really trying to enforce here is the idea that we have to think about poverty and social problems as being multidimensional. So we have to think about uh, poverty as being multidimensional. And this is a quote from Muhammad Yunus, and you'll, you'll see that what, I think one of the main things uh, that I like about Muhammad Yunus and his philosophy is that it's very, very ambitious and inspirational, and it pushes the boundaries. And this is what he's saying, and poverty does not belong in civilised human society. Its proper place in a, is in a museum. And although this is, you know, this is rhetoric, you know, it's actually true. There is no justified reason why we should accept that people should not have the ability to fulfill their potential. And what social business as a, as a concept kind of focuses on is individuals. Individuals being the key to alleviating poverty individuals being the key to solving and breaking down these barriers and enabling uh, uh, having the solidarity with people and ensuring that people have the ability to fulfill their potential and the key point and the, the kind of the key crux of this of this uh, focus here on the individual is creativity and in a, in a structured society, in a society how it's worked today, often creativity is being used to either make money for someone else, make money for yourselves, or in fact creativity is kind of floundered inside a system that doesn't really promote entrepreneurship, especially in schools, right? We're, schools, we're kind of taught to kind of get our degree, go to university and then go and work for someone else. But actually, when we talk about uh, the Eunice kind of philosophy and this idea of social business, it's saying that creativity is, is the key to solving social problems. And this idea of independence that Dr. Fires was just recently talking about, this is something so powerful and so, uh, has so much potential. And actually, who are the most creative people in the world? Well, it's young people. It is actually young people who have the best ideas. This is not, again, it's not, this is not rhetoric. This is actually scientifically proven that the brain is much more, uh, it's much more creative uh, in its younger ages. And also we're less bound by the kind of pillars that society in its existing form has structured it, structured people to think in a certain way. So 
you know, we have a responsibility as the most creative people uh, to basically take the lead in this and to come up with fresh ideas, new ideas, use our inner entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurial self to solve social problems. And I want to, and this is where I'm coming back to this idea again. Philanthropy and philosophy, the love of man, the love of wisdom, and what's the meaning of, what's the meaning of work? What's the meaning of our, of our application in life and application in society? And we have, a, we have a video here, but yeah, I just want to put on this as well. There's a, there's a, there's a saying from Hamid Yunus, which is, making money is fun, but helping other people and, uh, and charis being, helping other people and changing the world is super fun, super happiness. And I think this is a... Uh, I think we all experience it, right? In small doses, when you help someone or you do someone a favor or you see someone else happy from, I don't know, they love the birthday present you got them or something like this, or you put on a nice party, you know, you get a really nice buzz. And that we don't make enough of this, actually, in how we apply ourselves in the, the biggest section of our lives, which is our, it's our careers, our, the, way, the way we conduct ourselves in the economy. So this is when Mohammed Yunus was in uh, Bangkok. which cannot be done under the present circumstances or present conceptual framework. And I pinpoint that the problem that we generated around the world is because of the uh, formulation of the economic theory in the capitalist system. They went wrong in several occasions and they blew up into creating many problems like wealth concentration is a major issue. Right now all the wealth of the world is concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. Uh, bulk of the people have done anything, everything is held by few people, and it's getting worse. So I say this is a, a ticking time bomb. It can explode because people will be extremely unhappy at the bottom because they don't get anything, everything goes there. So how to address that, how to reverse that, how to stop the wealth concentration and reverse the wealth to come down rather than going up. Three zeros into a new book, a world of three zero, no poverty, no unemployment, and no carbon emissions. That's right. Why do you believe that three factors are really uh, important for better future? Yeah, there are many, many problems that we have, but I chose three very important ones from my perspective. One is zero poverty. I always say that poverty should not belong to the civilized human being. It is not something part of a human being, it's sacrificially imposed on human being because of the mistakes we have made in our conceptualization and so on. I keep repeating that poverty is not created by poor people. Poverty is imposed on poor people by the system that we have built. So if you redesign the system, there will be no person in the world will be poor person. So I'm struggling with the system, how to undo the system. Zero unemployment is the same way. I'm addressing the system. I said the problem of unemployment is created by the concept of employment. Because the capitalist system believes that everybody has to go and work for somebody else. I said this is a completely wrong thing. Human beings are not born to work for anybody. Human beings are complete by themselves. They are entrepreneurs, they are go-getters, they are problem solvers. So human beings should become entrepreneurs. That's their destiny, that's what they are. But the system has pushed them to work for somebody. So as a result, they give up their, uh, their creative capacity. All human beings have unlimited creative capacity. But if you accept a job, that surrenders all your creative capacity. Zero net carbon emission, of course, in order to save this planet, we have to get out of this. If the more carbon we emit, the more quickly we will blow ourselves into disaster. So that's a third zero. So these are the three zeros which addresses the problem of the capitalist system. So if we have to address the system in a way, we create a new system. New system not uh, dismantling the old system, by redesigning the old system. So in redesigning, we're saying that there will be two kinds of business. Business to make money, business to solve problems. So then we call it social business, conventional business and social business. If you have two, uh, two businesses like that, then world will be a very different place. And instead of job seeking, we become entrepreneurs. Three zero are 
against conventional beliefs in capitalism. Absolutely. But you are having your own way, your own model of capitalism. Yes, we are redesigning the capitalism. We are not throwing away capitalism. We are getting rid of all the things which were wrong in the capitalist system. So if you fix that, then capitalism becomes a new system. And instead of <clears throat> greed-based system, which we have now, the whole the world is greed-based. Instead of greed-based system, we become a system with human values, with compassion. Why do you believe in the power of being entrepreneurs and believe that it's the second nature in human beings? Human being basically is a created being. That's the difference between animals and human beings. Animals spend their lifetime repeating themselves every day, search for food. They search for food and survive, and on the day, next day, again, they start searching for food. So this is their cycle. Human being is completely different. Taking food, finding food is not their uh, full-time engagement. They have enormous creative capacity to do more than what any other animal, any other creature can do. So that's what they the special thing about the human being. But somehow, capitalist system misinterpreted that. They said, no, human being has to go and work for somebody else. I said, that is a misuse of uh, the whole human uh, possibilities and so on and so forth. So I said, the human being should play the role of an entrepreneur and uh, be creative and do things that he enjoys, that she enjoys. Not because uh, she has to survive, she has to go and work for somebody else. So I think you know, this isn't, that isn't necessarily uh, a social business specific thing, this is just something in general because you know, you're all leaders and you're going to be leaders in the future. But this concept of psychological safety, this will help you in building a team in social business and, and, and in actually whatever you do. And the final one here, which ties into this as well, is do it with joy. Sounds a bit gimmicky, but it's very, very, very important. You know, to actually apply yourself and to create something significant like your own business, your own social business, you have to make sure you enjoy it. So, and this comes back to what Dr. Fives was saying. You know, only do things because this is what you want to do. Be independent, be uh, the champions of yourself and be the champions of your own future. So it's essential this one. It's actually the most important one. Do it with joy. Because it'll actually mean, if you're doing it with joy, then it's much, much more likely to be a success. It might not be. But for sure, if you don't do it with joy, if you don't enjoy it, 100% it won't be a success. Then it depends. It depends on the on each social business. There is a 
there was a contract signed with each investor. But um, normally the, the the investor invests, if they don't get back their investment, then that's, uh, that's a problem. But normally the investor works with the social business. It depends, but uh, does, that, does, that, does that make sense? It, it depends on a case by case example. But normally, the investor invests, and then if the social business fails, then that was just a philanthropic. Yeah. Can you just explain more on the fifth point? Like, how is the investment amount paid back? Can you give a Can you give a real life example of that fourth point? Like, how is the investment amount paid back? Yeah. So, uh, for example, Grameen Dano. This is a social business uh, in Bangladesh. So maybe our Bangladeshi friends can uh, tell us more about it. Uh, they probably know more about it than me. But Grameen Dano was created because there was a problem in Bangladesh with child malnutrition. So there's many, many children suffer from lacking the, the multivitamins and the iron and the vitamin B. Uh, in, in their daily diets. So Dano and Professor Yunus and Grameen uh, combined together uh, to basically produce a yogurt. A yogurt that had all these multivitamins in, inside that would um, solve child malnutrition if, if a child ate it regularly. But interestingly, it didn't just solve child malnutrition, it was also tasty. This is, this is a very key point here. We're not just solving a, a social need, we're also solving or answering consumer want as well, right? So it's a tasty yogurt that sold child malnutrition. And importantly, it was, it was sold at a very uh, low price and made it accessible to, uh, to, to poor families. So Grameen Dino invested the infrastructure costs you know, to build a factory in Bangladesh, the distribution network, these things, and basically signed a long-term agreement so that they will get back that money over an extended period of time. Um, so that's basically how how it how Green Denim works. And also, you can have an, another principle of social business, which is often it's not a principle, but it's a method that's often utilised, is cross subsidisation. So you can sell your, for example, they sold more expensive dairy products once it was established to richer families, which made more profit, which can therefore support the, the social business to solve, to provide the product for the, for the, for the bottom of the pyramid, customer segment, like the poorer, poorer people. So basically, Dunham invested at the start, and then over a long term period of time, and then once the, once the um, the yogurt company became profitable, they accrued back their investment. And uh, I think now, how many, how many yogurts do they sell now? Is it six million? It's, uh, it's in the millions how many yogurts are sold in Bangladesh now. It's, it's, in, it's an incredible, it's an incredible success story. And yeah, so here's just some of the uh, examples uh, of social businesses. So we have uh, Grameen Gula, uh, which works on basically water purification and selling water uh, in Bangladesh. Grameen Dano, this is the one I was just talking about. We have uh, Grameen Shakti, which is basically selling so um, solar panels and village biogas systems and also um, clean cook stoves. And they do this basically to sell them at a very cheap price. But the difference is they sell it on a credit based system. So obviously these products were already available, but poor families couldn't afford to buy them. So they say pay in monthly installments, uh, no need for collateral, and therefore um, people who can afford them on a gradual basis. And interestingly, from something like a uh, solar panel, you can create what we call like micro utility systems. So you can start a small micro enterprise based on 
based on the income, the electricity that comes from a solar panel. So it could be that you can do your market stall open late at night. It could be that you have a phone charging small shop. It could be, uh, it could be that your restaurant stays open longer. But the idea is that if you provide this renewable energy system to people that weren't able to access it, they can actually create more income for themselves, uh, which means they can pay for the system but as long as they pay for it over a longer period of time. So, uh, yeah, and also the Grameen Creative Lab as well, this work, this is based in Germany and this works with big companies as well on how to create joint ventures with kind of UNIS social business families to create social businesses. So this is where Green Dylan, for example, comes from. And there's lots of other interesting ones as well. Green Intel, this is another UNIS social business. So they created um, these bangles, which basically give uh, pregnant women alerts when they should uh, when they should be taking their medicine or when they should be going for a doctor to check these things. So it just gives a little vibrate. But the interesting thing is that they're very fashionable and they look very nice, so people want them as well. So there's lots of little innovations and basically how do you answer, and I love this point, how do you answer a social need and also a customer want at the same time? Something needed and also desirable. 